All right, good morning, everybody, and welcome to WSIRCON in San Francisco. This is, as, as Devaka said, this is our second, uh, second visit here, and we look forward to continuing this. And, and this year, it's grown about, 20, about 50% from last year's size, so that's even better. And I'm going to be, uh, so my, my job is to kind of set the stage for all the stuff that we're going to be talking about uh, in, in the remaining two days of the conference. And what I'm going to try to do is to give you a little bit of an understanding of our broader vision about what we are trying to do, and then a little bit of an understanding about what the company is and how we are structured and how we operate. And the, the rest of the two days, there's a lot of detailed conversations that you can have with various product teams and sort of all kinds of customers. So, so we certainly encourage you to talk to a bunch of people to get a better understanding of the high level picture that I'm gonna to try to paint for you and then, uh, then all the details that go behind it. So we are running a little bit late, so I will uh, start without much delay and try to get through a little bit quickly. So what we are trying to do as a company is enable enable you to connect the world. And when I say connect the world, so the world has a combination of people, applications, and devices. And our mission is to enable you as a customer to build whatever kind of connectivity that you want to have between them in, in whatever level of complexity, whatever level of deep integration, whatever style of interaction, and so forth. And, and this is a, a, a dramatic challenge now because the scale is so large. We, we now have billions of people who are connected to the internet, about half the world's population now. Uh, there are millions and millions of applications. And of course, all the IoT uh, predictions about the number of connected devices is, is crazy. It's gonna go up to 20 billion, 50 billion in short order and so forth. And, and all of these things, in order for them to be productive and useful for you as a human being, they all need to be connected in some form in, in whatever levels of connectedness that, that makes sense for the different kinds of devices, different kinds of applications. And that's really what we are trying to do and, and what we're trying to enable uh, for, for you to do, basically. Uh, so why, why do this? What is the benefit from a business point of view for connecting the world? So let me just boil it down to three particular aspects that, that, that can sort of highlight the, the benefits. So the first one is get closer to your customers. In the old days, you put up a shop, people come to you, they buy their stuff, they go home. Uh, now that's not the case. Nobody goes anywhere now. They sit at home, they, they're online, they use mobile devices, they use all kinds of connected means to get at you. And also, they go to other places. They hang out a lot on Facebook. They might hang out on Snapchat, whatever the place is. So if your, your business is not where the customers are, you're far away from them. So we have a lot of customers now who are working with us on taking their business to the customer instead of waiting for the customer to come to you. Go to wherever the customer is and open up in that, in that space, in whatever the environment that is, in whatever the appropriate format that is for that environment. And that's a major, uh, major direction that we, we see a lot of people uh, doing. Um, the second one is this concept of becoming a viral business. So uh, let me expand that on a bit. This is really the, the magic that Steve Jobs pulled off with the iPhone, which is that it wasn't just a fantastic platform for people to use, but it was also a platform for developers to create applications. It's this concept of being a generative platform or a platform that lets you generate new innovations leveraging the power of the platform and, and yet just writing just a little bit, just a little app bit, and then becoming a, a part of a much bigger ecosystem, much bigger environment and so forth. And that's, that's really a key part of what made that whole world take off, the fact that there was a platform that allowed people to innovate. And of course, you know, uh, the iPhone was not the first platform that did. If you go back, in some sense, even Windows was a platform like that. Windows operating system, people wrote all kinds of applications on top of that. But it was a different time, different world, different distribution model, a different level of scale that was possible than, than in the modern world with, with connectivity and, and handheld devices and lower cost aspects. Uh, the, the third reason is to extend your boundaries. So as a company, a, a people tend to operate within their organization quite a bit. But more and more, the people you operate with are not just a little internal part, but we are decomposing the organization more and more. So you're connecting to partners, to suppliers, to customers, and also enabling other people to create things through the viral business models and so forth. So to do that, the definition of an organization fundamentally changes from being a closed environment where there was a firewall and you were nicely protected to being a much more open, extended architecture. And so extending the boundary basically means opening yourself up for other people to become a, a part, of, uh, part of you and extend what capabilities you have as well as for you to take benefit from all the extended capabilities that somebody else has. So you don't have to innovate everything. You can build on other people's things. And, and, and eventually, this is all about expanding the business opportunity that a customer, that an organization has. So really about generating more revenue. And the other part, of course, is that 
it is, it is very critical that, that whenever there are these kind of major transitions that happen in the technology world, the people who don't adapt and adopt the direction that's coming end up getting left behind, and then it becomes very, very difficult to catch up. Right? In many cases, people don't catch, uh, catch up, and companies die and new companies are born. And, and sometimes that's a good thing. This is part of the evolutionary cycle of, of business innovation. Uh, but if you're within that organization, you don't want to just sit down and lie down and take it. You want to try to try to do it better. And that's, that's what we want to enable. We want to enable people to think long term about what it means to be connected, what it means to be a connected business, what it means to be a connected organization, and to connect all these applications, devices, and people that, that we are dealing with today. <clears throat> so let me take each one of these and kind of talk more at a technical level, saying what, what does it take to actually do this? So if you want to get closer to your customers and you want to be present next to your customers, that means you need to open up your capabilities through connected devices and applications. So it's not just mobile devices now anymore, of course. It's also any kind of connected devices. It means in order for those applications to come back home, you need some level of API management. And you can't do API management without having services that help you make those APIs available. So you need SOA. You need social integration. You need identity management. And of course, you, everybody wants to know what's going on, who's doing what, how many times are they doing this, and so forth. So there's, there's all the analytic stuff that comes into play. Now, if you look at the becoming a viral business, it's a similar set of requirements, but slightly different, because it's, it's a big part about enabling, again, people to innovate. So it's not just API management enabling people to innovate, but also having a platform that people can create their opportunities, their ideas, and then sell those to the customers. So giving them a, a, a sort of an infrastructure and a cloud environment and self-service environment so people can innovate by themselves. Uh, of course, identity, social, analytics are all part of this as well, right? So the, the, you, can't, you can't do any of the other things without having these capabilities. And extending your boundaries is similar. So you need API management, you need integration, SOA, analytics, mobility, connected devices, DevOps as part of enablement, again, for people to be a lot more innovative, a lot more iterative, and a lot more agile in terms of how fast they can get an idea from being an idea to go take it to market. And, and so, so uh, to do all this, of course, you need a bunch of stuff. You need a platform. So everybody out there is talking about a platform. If you look at every, every technology vendor, they say, oh, we have a platform that can do all this stuff. Uh, uh, of course, the, the catch is you need not just a platform that does one of these things, such as API management or integration or, or cloud or whatever it is, but it takes a platform that does all of these things at the same time. Because otherwise, you have to go integrate all this stuff and build your own platform on top of the platforms that you buy from other people. And that's the, that's the advantage that we bring to you. We are the only company ever to have built a complete middleware stack. And that's not a BS statement. Nobody else has built a middleware stack. Everybody has, all the big players have a middleware stack, but it's all a bunch of acquisitions nicely marketed together as a single stack. And if you try to put them all together as a single stack, you'll find out the uh, marketing's beautiful, reality is not. And uh, in our case, we have from, from scratch built a complete stack that was designed from scratch to be an integrated architecture and integrated platform. And that's the advantage we bring uh, to, to customers. And, and, uh, and the other part of the platform is it's not a platform of silos. It's not a matter of saying, OK, I have an API management stack I can get from vendor A. I have an integration or an ESB I can get from vendor B. I have a cloud platform I can get from another guy. I have an MDM or a device management thing, and so forth, an identity from another guy. Because it's not about having a set of silos that you need to worry about. It's about having an integrated, connected platform that people can build applications and build value and build their connected experience on top of. And that's really the strength and advantage that we bring, we bring to the table uh, versus anybody else in the market. <clears throat> um, so some of the aspects of a connected platform that we have as an advantage that, that people, uh, that, that we built over the last nine and a half years uh, is that uh, we have a, we ship somewhere in the range of 25 products now. Uh, but they're really one code base. So at a technical level, at an engineering level, we have one product. We have a single product called Carbon, which has a component architecture into which we install all kinds of capabilities, and then we package them and distribute them in different packages. The reason we package them differently for different people is there are people who need a particular capability stack, and they say, oh, no problem, we can give you that. But if you want to combine them, re-architect what you want to build with our stuff, you can do that as well. So it's really a set of products that work with different personalities offering different capabilities, but still at, a, at an architecture, at a design, at an implementation level, one code base. What that means is we are able to give multiple deployment choices. So we also have the same code running in a private cloud, in an on-premise model, as well as in a public cloud. We're able to give a single developer experience to everybody. 
So a developer who goes from one product to another product doesn't start again learning out, okay, where's the config file? What, what, how do you set up the security? How do you set up the database connection? How do you set up the identity management? All that stuff is common across the platform. Uh, uh, similarly, from an operational uh, management point of view, if you're looking at clustering or looking at log analysis, everything is common. And that's a huge advantage that, that this connected platform gives you for a, pro a customer trying to build on the next level on top of this. So uh, let me talk, uh, let me now switch gears a little bit and talk a little bit about the company, just to give you an understanding of how we have come to this point and be able to build this stuff, because this is a pretty broad play, obviously. <clears throat> So we started in 2005, uh, we are now uh, nine and a half years old, and we have a, a, you know, as a startup company in 2005, we had a bit of a crazy vision. We, we set out saying we're gonna build a complete middleware platform. We were gonna take on IBM and Oracle. We were not setting out for something small. And, and that's not something, you know, it's not an easy thing when you're a startup. Normally people build one product and try to make, get a few customers and, and sell it off or, or you know, go on from there. We knew the problem we were trying to address cannot be addressed like that. It is technologically impossible to address a platform by creating one product, making it successful, then creating the next product, making it successful, and, and so forth. So we started with three products initially, and then we built this carbon platform, combined everything together, and kind of created this framework. And now we really have one product at a technical level, but we package them and market them differently for customer needs. Uh, and as a company, we have a certain set of principles that we operate on. First thing is, every single thing we do is 100% open source. That's not negotiable, that's not for discussion, that is not for anything. Uh, that is what the company is founded on. It's open source under Apache license. That means any one of our competitors can take all of our products and rebrand them and sell it even if they want. Right? That is legal by the Apache license and that's okay if people want to do that. Um, we, what we have as an asset is the brand of the company, is the image we've created, is, is the recognition around we are the people who are innovating in this space that people can rely on for getting support and services for the products that we build. Um, we're also a global company. We, we, we operate heavily. I live in Sri Lanka now. I lived here for 16 years. I moved back uh, 14, uh, nearly 14 years ago. Uh, we operate uh, mostly out of Sri Lanka, but we are a single global organization. We have a single global log chart. It's not an outsourcing model, which is the typical way people, companies organize now. It is a completely global innovation platform that we operate, very heavily driven by email because that's the only still viable communication format for uh, time distributed, location distributed communication, uh, and, and, and so forth. And we follow this thing called the Apache Way, Apache Software Foundation, and, and Brian Berlendorf is one of the founders of the Apache Software Foundation. Apache uh, came up with this model of uh, decision making, of operating, of communicating, of kind of working in a team that has been very successful in creating a whole lot of really good software. And we followed that inside the company. Uh, obviously slightly adapted because we are a corporation, we have, we have customer needs and we have other stuff that we need to worry about, but we, we follow that very, very closely. Uh, and long term, what we're trying to become is the number one middleware company. We are not trying to do something small. We are not trying to just uh, take this little space of the market. This is a massive market. The, just the core middleware market is like a $60 billion market, and we are trying to go after that whole market. Um, so after nine years, we've kind of, we're getting somewhere. We are not there yet. Uh, we, this is a Gartner report from earlier this year, which has a comprehensive plat uh, a platform uh, evaluation, and we are on the table with, uh, with fairly big companies. Uh, we, we know we can beat all these guys. We, you know, technologically, we are far ahead, but of course, we don't expect Gartner to recognize us as far ahead because we're still a small company. Uh, but it's moving along, and it's an iterative process, and it's something we, we keep chugging along and, and, and hammering on. Uh, I want to quickly talk a little bit about some of the things that we do that are sort of different. I think Devaka mentioned this also about how we do things differently, and I'm going to talk about four or five different aspects of the company that we do differently. So the first thing is about engineering because this is a technology-led vision that we are driving about how the world is going to be and then what's the technology we can create. Um, one key thing that we, we did when we started the company was to say engineering in WS2 is not going to be just about R&D. Uh, and this came from my own experience in when I used to work in IBM. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff I wrote. I was in IBM research. There's a bunch of stuff I wrote that went into various product things, but I never got an opportunity to talk to customers. Okay, there's a research guy writing some code. They take it over. And that's it. Never ever see a customer. So I never got any feedback on whether this stuff is good or not. And open source is the opposite. In the open source world, in the Apache Foundation, you join a mailing list. The people who design the code, write the code, test the code, they're the ones who answer user questions. There's no separate support team. There's no separate QA team. There's no separate architecture team. None of that stuff. You write code. You design code. You document it. You answer questions. You do everything. Right? That's the model we follow in the company. Every single engineer participates in all parts of the software process. 
So just even within R&D, we don't have an architect team that designs architecture and writes a spec and gives it to the team saying, go write this code. It doesn't work like that. They're all, everybody's part of it, and we debate stuff, and it's very iterative. And then, of course, it's not just about R&D. We also want every engineer to participate in marketing. So every person goes through a rotation cycle. Only 50% of their time is spent on R&D. The remaining 50% is on this other stuff. So they spend time on doing marketing. That means writing some blogs, maybe writing some technical content, maybe doing a webinar, maybe doing a presentation, uh, and so forth. So whatever the stuff that they go attending a conference and doing a, a talk at a conference. And also, they go into doing pre-sales. So if one of you, uh, one of our potential customers, and we are doing pre-sales stuff, some of those people are coming from the engineering team. They, they are rotating into doing a pre-sales task. And, and then uh, when we do engagements, customer engagements on services stuff, whether it's some kind of development services or some support, uh, some on-site work, again, it's a product team member that goes for it. And then when it comes to support, uh, the, most of the engineering team, uh, most of the support team is, is from the core product teams. About 30 people rotate into support all the time into support. And, then, and now we are running our own public cloud, so we're trying to get people more involved with the operational side as well, because it's really interesting to learn how difficult it is to keep running a server at five nines availability. You know, it takes, it, and, and engineers don't understand, they're like, well, you know, I write my code, I put my config file here, just put the database connection there, and you're done. Well, it doesn't work if you put it into across 100 servers, or if you have multiple availability zones, there's all kinds of challenges that come up. And that's something that product design, product engineering needs to take into account, and the only way you can do that is if you really understand and all that stuff. And that's, that's, what, we are, that's what our engineering model is. So it's not just about R&D, it's very important for us. Um, we have a very transparent operation model. We communicate everything to everybody. Uh, it's a little bit crazy because every single person is on every mailing list. Right? So we are now 460 plus people in the company. So it kind of gets a little bit big. Uh, but still, you read what you want and what you can read and what you want to read. But there is no information withholding. Uh, this is, again comes from my own previous experience where if you were invited to the meeting, you were in the loop. If you're not invited to the meeting, you were not in the loop. Simple as that. In WSO2, if you want to, find, if you want to be in the loop, read the stuff. That's it. Right? We don't hold anything back. Every meeting invitation is supposed to go to a mailing list, the appropriate mailing list. And if you want to participate, you're welcome to participate. Of course, there are some people that must participate in order for the conversation to be useful, so you invite them directly, and they must participate. But everybody can participate. And then the Apache-style decision-making, and, and also this model of sort of no management. Uh, this is something I personally believe a lot in. I, I'm not, uh, uh, I, I, I don't like people just sitting and managing things. I want people to do stuff. And so we have a lot of leaders. People lead all kinds of things. But we have few people who are sort of managing versus leading. So we ship 25 products. We don't have a single project manager in the company. Right? We ship them with the engineering team taking ownership, taking responsibility for dates, and, and doing the best you can to get, to get things out. Um, the business model, very straightforward. We try hard not to give any BS to any of you guys. We put stuff up on the website. Everything we put up on the website is 100% true. We don't usually market anything before the code is available. So everything I'm going to talk about today, is, I'm going to talk about some stuff that's not released yet. But if you want, go to the architecture mailing list, go to the dev, dev uh, repository. You can check out the code. It's all there. Right? There's no BS involved. <clears throat> and we're also very particular that we don't want to sell you stuff that you don't need. So one of the common things that you hear from customers who buy the big vendor software is you buy a lot of shelfware. You buy it, it gets installed on the shelf, and stays there, never goes into production. We have no desire to do that because we are an annual recurring support model. If you do that, next year you're going to hit us anyway, saying, why the hell did you sell me 25 servers? You're not using two of them. Right? Whereas the license model, it's a different model. We are a support company. So, uh, and we, we have a fixed price model. We, we don't negotiate, and we don't give each person a different price. Uh, we have a published uh, volume discount schedule. If you buy a lot, you get something. That is a normal kind of uh, behavior. <clears throat> Openness is very, very important. 100% open source, all the source code, everything is open source, but it's not just about open source. It's also about open standards. One of the key things about the connected world is open interoperability standards. There's a ton of standards that drive the world and enable connectivity. And so we are very proactively looking and participating in standards efforts and incorporate them as quickly as we can into enabling our stuff to work with other people's stuff. We know none of you guys will likely ever become a WSO2 only technology company. Right? Everybody's got all kinds of things from other people. So connecting and integrating them is very important. So open standards is a very, very important part. Uh, in terms of how we do our own development, we practice open development. So all of our stuff, every conversation is public. You can join our mailing list and see internal arguments. Well, they're not internal because they're public arguments that we do about architecture, about development, whatever it is. right? And then the business model itself is very, very straightforward, very open, and we, we try to share everything we can. 
the team works as a single team focused on one effort. So we don't have sort of this, the typical organization has lots of inter-organizational boundary defining and, and sort of territory carving. We try very hard to avoid that. Uh, with 400 plus people, it is obviously more and more challenging because not everybody knows everybody anymore, right? 400 people, it's impossible to know everybody. Uh, but it, it is something that we are striving very hard to retain as a key foundation of the company that enables people to really work in a single team with a single objective, which is make the company successful. And making the company successful means enabling our customers to be successful because we are a middleware company. And if our guys, if our customers don't take our stuff and build something useful with it, we can never be successful right, as a middleware company. So I, uh, just to summarize on, on the way the company is architected, we are a very connected organization internally. We try hard to get this model of people talking to each other, all the applications talking to each other, all the devices talking to each other inside the company so that we can enable other people to build similar experiences for, their, for your customers. Right? Now let me talk a little bit about some product stuff that we're doing and then, then I'll, I'll wrap up. Uh, <clears throat> So we have a, a, as you know, from our, you know, if you've been looking at our products, we have a lot of products, we have a lot of areas we focus on. So I'm gonna give a, an update on a couple of different areas that, that we are doing some significant changes and significant evolution. Uh, and, and hopefully that'll give you some, uh, some uh, overall insight. And then if you're interested in detail on any of this, there are talks on all of this stuff in the, in the conference, so I encourage you to attend those. So let me talk about mobility and IoT. So last year we announced a product called the Enterprise Mobility Manager. Uh, so this year we're announcing that we are evolving that product. So it's kind of fast evolution. Uh, so Enterprise Mobility Manager was focused on mobile devices, iOS, Android, Windows, sort of the, the mobile telephonic devices. What we're doing now is kind of taking that and saying, well, that's great, but really connected devices are much bigger than just mobile devices. Mobile devices are very, very important. We are by no means backing off from what everything EMM was trying to do and is going to do. This is adding a lot more stuff to it saying, we also want to support any kind of connected device, not just mobile devices. Everything from a Raspberry Pi to an Arduino to, uh, to an air conditioner to a, a, a refrigerator to a car and so forth, all being managed in a connected device environment. So, so uh, EMM is being split into two parts. One is the connected device manager, which is sort of the MDM part, which is a mobile device management part being broadened out into much, being much more than mobility, but just any kind of connected device. And then separating the application management part Again, into a much broader space, we, we started working on with one of our customers uh, last year uh, a, a project, a product to kind of allow web application management, uh, to allow people to have an app store and be able to sign up and have a portal of the applications that you're using and then manage them and have a single sign-on analytics and so forth. So we're merging that with the mobile application management part. So you have a single app store that lets you see your mobile apps, your web apps, and soon we will add, be adding desktop applications and eventually console applications as well so that you can say, okay, I want to go in here and see what are all the applications that I have available for me. If it's a web app, I'll be able to single sign on directly into that. If it's a mobile app, you can install, you see your devices, you can install them onto the devices that you own and so forth. Right? And, and so this is a, a, a broader vision about how we see devices and mobility playing out going forward. We talk about App Factory. So we, uh, App Factory is a product we announced uh, about nearly two years ago now. Uh, and it's a, it's a, a, a ALM product. It's a product that lets you create and build new applications in an integrated self-service platform. And there was a tutorial about that yesterday. There will be some more talks. So it's, uh, um, and, and it's really the, the, the real killer opportunity is if you are trying to give developers a, a self-service IT environment because that's what people want app, uh, and people are going out to Amazon, going out to various places to pick up stuff because they don't have that self-service ticketless IT experience, App Factory can do that. App Factory is a very comprehensive product for that. What we are doing now is App Factory in the early days were designed for sort of building and writing WSO2 specific applications. Now we've completely generalized that. It has a concept of pluggable app type, so you can plug in any kind of applications. So we are going to ship the new version with PHP, Node.js, um, and, and a bunch of other stuff, as well as .NET support. So you can actually create a .NET application in App Factory, take it through the entire lifecycle, deploy it onto a, a cloud environment that obviously runs .NET. And, and manage its complete lifecycle, manage versions, and everything that App Factory does. Uh, this is, of course, powered by Apache Stratos, which is the PaaS framework that we created and donated to Apache last year. Uh, Stratos is, is doing extremely well. There's a lot of different people using all kinds of different stuff. And Stratos has now support for .NET and any kind of uh, cartridge that it runs. And that's what App Factory is leveraging to make this work. Uh, tooling. This is a kind of a big uh, adjustment from what, the way we've been doing tools. 
So we started using Eclipse as our tooling platform in 2006. We started creating tools. And, and that's when, when, when people say Eclipse, what they mean is what Eclipse calls RCP, Rich Client Platform, which is their swing, the Java-based uh, IDE platform. And, and we've been building a set of tools on, on Eclipse RCP. Um, and and it's, been, it's been very good, uh, but we also see a need to go to a lot more web-centric tooling experience. So Eclipse is just announcing, I think today or yesterday, uh, a new project called Eclipse J, which is a donation from a Code Envy, from the Code Envy platform to Eclipse to create a, essentially a web-based IDE experience. Right? It's, it's, a, it's more than just IDE, but IDE is the part that we are primarily focusing on. An IDE experience, so you can have a complete uh, development exp experience uh, running inside the browser. Uh, so we've been working with Code Envy for, for about a year plus now. We actually demoed some stuff last year at the conference as well. And so what we are doing now is we are going to be migrating our long-term tooling strategy on to Eclipse J and then building a, building a complete tooling framework on top of that. Uh, so part of that is also we are not expecting everybody to say, okay, well, we no longer have you know, tools on my laptop. I have to go run it open inside my browser. No, not at all. We're also going to have a downloadable form that you can run, and that's going to be using embedded Tomcat and embedded Chromium. So Chromium is the open source version of the, the Google browser, uh, Chrome browser. And, and that allows you to have an embedded version so that you can basically run a command and you get an Eclipse, a traditional Eclipse-like experience with a local product running. And it doesn't look like a browser. It looks like a normal, normal experience, basically. Uh, and that's important for us because for us, the, there are a lot of developers who still need absolutely disconnected development capability on the laptop. We can't tell people saying, oh, OK, if you want to develop, be connected to the internet and just go to this website and develop off of that. It won't work in a... In a uh, uh, in a large enterprise setting anyway, and even in a large enterprise setting, if you deploy it in a private cloud, you still want people to be able to operate disconnected. So this is a, a, a direction that we are embarking on. Uh, this is a new effort. It's going to take us some time. So we're obviously not stopping support for our current tooling. We're going to continue to support it uh, until the other one is completely ready and then slowly migrate uh, people onto this. Uh, we will have a milestone on this available. Uh, uh, if it's not available already, it'll be available very soon. Uh, for people to download and try out what the new experience is going to be. And our initial plan is to support the app server and the app cloud as a tooling experience. So, so if you're writing things that are running in the app server, then the, the tool will support that first, and then slowly adding all the other products one by one. Um, the other cool thing I really like about this is, a, a, in traditional Eclipse-style tooling world, you separate the tool and the IDE and the development experience from the runtime very clearly. One of the beauties of Che is that we can, we can get it to the point where if you have an exception, we can generate a link in that exception on the, on the admin console or even in the log files. If you click on this link, it'll open the ID with the code pointed to exactly where that exception occurred. Right? And that's very powerful. And that's the kind of stuff that we kind of envision going forward, where we can merge a lot more of the developer experience to the runtime experience through Che as a foundation. And, and that's something that we're going to uh, continue to rethink and evolve over the years as we go along. Uh, analytics is a big space. We, we've done a lot of work. Uh, we, have a, we have two products, a real-time analytics product from the complex event process and, and the business activity monitor. Um, uh, we are adding another key part to this. So, uh, the, uh, so our model is basically, let me just go to the picture and then I'll explain this. So maybe you can't see it. Let me stick here. Uh, <coughs> Uh, so uh, we have events coming in. We can analyze them real time with the complex event processor. CEP is an extremely fast product. It can do about 300,000 events per second on, on, on the, over the network. Um, and then BAM is a store and process analysis. It's currently using Hadoop. We are also working towards going towards Spark on that front. Uh, uh, but it's basically store the events in Cassandra, then do whatever kind of batch analysis that you want. The machine learning stuff is really about saying, well, not only do I want to do batch analysis, but I also want to do some analysis on the data and figure out what patterns can I derive from this data. So applying va apply various machine learning algorithms against the data and against a test set and a training set, obviously, and then come up with decision models and then take those decision models, pump them back into the, the real-time engine, including the ESP in the complex event processor, whatever other places you're making decisions, and be able to do predictive behavior using that. Right? And that's what we are embarking on with this product. So this is a, something we started on uh, earlier this year, and we have a, a milestone that's uh, uh, about to be released if it's not already released again. Uh, and and it's, a, it's a cool thing because it's something that, that we see as a long-term future, uh, future thing. 
Along with that, we're adding an event stream store, so you can have a complete view of all the events that are in the organization, plus well as a way of monitoring and creating a dashboard out of all those events. So I won't go through the details. I'm running slightly late. Uh, governance is something that we've focused on for a long time. We have a governance registry product. But one of the things that we haven't done really well is integrate the underlying models, the metadata, across all the products. Each product saves a bunch of metadata into the governance registry, but the level of connectivity between them has not been very good. So we're making a significant effort to try to have a single unified metadata model across all the products, and then to have complete sort of sharing across that. And this is a, a deep technical piece of work that's going on. Uh, uh, the, the, this will become part of the governance registry 5.0 as the primary entry vehicle, but it will also go into every product and, and become a part of the overall uh, integrated experience. Uh, we have our public cloud stuff, which is, again, the same software running in a public cloud deployment. Uh, we have API cloud and app cloud that are uh, pretty much on, 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 uh, ready for production use very soon now. Uh, we've been working on two other clouds, an integration cloud and a device cloud, and we have some more stuff coming along. Uh, but I, I want to just briefly give an update on this. Uh, and, and other key thing is because of the common governance model, the co common, governance, common uh, deployment architecture, what we're really creating is a single cloud that has the ability to say, you can come and say, I want to create an application, create a service, make an API out of it, write a web app, maybe that calls that thing, look at the analytics, uh, integrate that API with something else through the integration cloud, and have that trigger an event, and have that event go back into the event cloud, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So that's what we're trying to build in, in this whole connected cloud experience. Uh, this is a, a picture of what's coming up. Let me briefly talk about the integration cloud, because this is a big space. Um, so we see the integration cloud as being not just about having a simple uh, sort of you know, drag and drop integration in the cloud. So ESP as a service is kind of full scale integration. Any kind of enterprise integration that you want to do, just host it available in the cloud. Uh, queuing uh, is an important thing. A lot of people create queues as application integration components. Again, we will have a service there. Uh, we have the workflow engine that's going to be available in, in, the, in the business process cloud. And this is new thing that we are creating called recipes. So a little bit inspired by IFT. Uh, if you haven't seen IFT, it's, IFT is kind of cool. If then, if this, then that. Dot com, if dot com. Uh, inspired a little bit by IFT, but it's a lot more, um, IFT is very cool, but it's very much if this, then that, right? So, so it's a very straightforward logic statement. This is really about saying take any kind of ESP integration and give that kind of recipe-like experience, integration recipes. So really pre-designed templates, integration templates that are being exposed for people to use and, and create uh, applications with, right? And this is uh, coming along as well in our deployment. So, um, to wrap up, uh, so you know, if you go through all this stuff that we're doing, there's a lot of things here. There's a lot of technology that touches all kinds of different spaces. But the bottom line is, if you're trying to build a connected platform, this is not a simple problem. At a computer science level, at, a, at, at, a, you know, at an IT infrastructure level, there's a lot of things that you have to touch and really integrate if you want to build a completely connected platform. And that's what we're trying to do. And this is not something that some, can be done in two years, five years. And, and you know, jump on the latest hype. Every day there's a different hype that comes up. Uh, if you haven't seen the garden hype curve, that's a beautiful picture that shows you where each of the hypes themselves are in the hype curve. Uh, it's like a meta hype. And, and it's, it's really cool because it, you can see how things come and things go. We don't get involved with hypes. We don't worry about hypes. We're looking at five, 10, 20 year roadmap saying, what do people really need in this space? What does it take technology wise to enable people to do the right thing? So, and, and we don't always get it right. When we get it wrong, we iterate fast. Uh, and, but our objective is not to be just a technology, uh, uh, not just a vendor to you, be as a technology vendor saying, okay, well, let me just sell you whatever we got today. But really understand where you want to go with your business, where you want to go with the company, with, with your, with, with your uh, mission, your objectives, and then help work with us to help us evolve the technology to really meet that objective. So we want to be your technology partner. So I really encourage you to talk to all the WS2 people here. There are 52 people from WS2 here today, uh, and from all kinds of engineering teams to all other parts of the company. So please do interact as much as you can. Uh, and any negative feedback, uh, we certainly welcome that. Uh, but more importantly, ideas that you think that we should be doing, that we shouldn't be doing, certainly would love to hear that. I'm also around the whole two days, so anytime, feel free to grab me and, and have a chat. And, uh, and, uh, and I hope you enjoy the conference and have a, have a wonderful time. This is a, 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 it's gonna be a busy event. There's a lot of different tracks, but uh, do try to make do whatever things you can. Thank you very much.